Today on From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, he begins a timely series called We Are Soldiers. Are you ready to suffer hardship as a soldier for Christ? Today we'll discover the weapons needed to win the spiritual battles to come in a lesson called The Lord's Army. my kids were little, one of the things that Debbie and I did was we got cassette tapes. CDs weren't really out at that time, and everything was cassette tapes. We had felt pretty big time because we had graduated from 8-track tapes, and uh, we had cassettes, and it was all a bunch of kids' songs on these cassettes, and we'd play them in the house, and we'd play them in the car, and the kids liked to uh, sing along and the songs, even though they were kids' songs, they were good songs because they taught the kids important truths. Now, one of the songs that played, I had never heard this song before until we started playing the, the kids' songs, and Debbie kind of looked at me like, really, you've never heard this song? She said, we always sang it in vacation Bible school. I said, well, I didn't go to vacation Bible school, so uh, that's probably why I've never heard of it. But the song, very familiar to many of you, I'm in the Lord's army. <laughs> I'm in the Lord's army. I may never march in the infantry. And you know, with kids, you had uh, motions, you know, so you'd march. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Hey, that's a great song for kids and adults, because it teaches a very important truth, and that truth is this. The moment that you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not only does he save you and take you out of darkness and move you into the kingdom of light, not only does he adopt you into his family, not only does he give you his Holy Spirit, but he enlists you in his army. Every believer is in the Lord's army. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. It's a battleground for the Lord's army. We're beginning a new series today entitled, We Are Soldiers. We Are Soldiers. It's based on the verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, where Paul says to Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Jesus. We are soldiers. We're in the Lord's army. And uh, we need to remember as we go through this life that, hey, I'm a soldier. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm called out to remember the Lord, as Nehemiah said, who is great and awesome and fight. Now, in the Lord's army, it's not like the human army. It's not like our United States military. They fight on a physical plane. We don't fight on a physical plane. We fight on a spiritual plane. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 6, your adversary, or it says, we don't wrestle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's a spiritual battle, and our weapons are the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the shield of faith, and the power of prayer. That's what we bring to the table in this battle. See, we don't fight the Muslims. We don't fight the atheists. We don't fight the agnostics. We don't fight the liberals. We don't fight the legalists. We don't fight the apostates. We're in a battle against the devil and his demonic horde. Now, the devil and his demonic horde, they use people, but the, but the, the people aren't the enemy. The devil is the enemy. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, but resist him, the scripture says, firm in your faith. 
And we are in a battle, and the enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy. He's like the original Terminator. He, he doesn't feel pity. He doesn't care about you and, and uh, your family. He wants to destroy you and your family. And he never takes a break. He never takes time off. He never has a little R&R. He goes constantly to steal and to kill and destroy. Now, Paul wrote to Timothy, the last letter he ever wrote, 2 Timothy. It was written about 67 AD, right at the same year that Paul was beheaded for his faith in Christ, for preaching the gospel, for never backing down. Now, he wrote to Timothy. Timothy is not, although he, Paul led him to the Lord and Paul calls him my true child in the faith, he calls him his son in the faith. Timothy was not like Paul you know, Paul is stronger than an acre of garlic. And sometimes you can read Paul and just think, man, I don't have the discipline that that guy had. I don't have the, the courage that that guy had. He's just amazing. I mean, five times he received 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times he was beaten with rods. Uh, once he was stoned, a day and a night he spent in the deep. All the things that he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the bad things that happened to him. And many of us would be like, good night. After one time getting 39 lashes from the Jews, I think I'd I'd go back to Jerusalem and maybe teach at the school. You know, I just wouldn't want to be on the front lines. He's such a front line guy. Well, Timothy is in Ephesus. Ephesus is a tough place. In Ephesus, they worship uh, Artemis, the great god of, goddess of the Ephesians. And there is much opposition to the gospel in Ephesus. But the Lord is working in Ephesus. And Timothy is the pastor in Ephesus. He's a young guy. And Paul tells him, don't let people look down on your youthfulness. He tells him, he speaks to him because he's timid. He says, God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. He tells Timothy, hey, Timothy, you might be tempted to quit. You might be tempted to leave your post, but don't do it, Timothy, because you're in the Lord's army. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus for no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Hey, here's our question to ponder. Are you a good soldier? of Christ Jesus? How are you doing in this thing called being a soldier? How are you doing in this thing called being faithful in the Lord's army? I wanna share with you three characteristics of a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And when the scripture says a good soldier, that word good means valuable, virtuous, worthy, a worthy soldier. A soldier used as a metaphor of a champion of the cause of Christ. Three characteristics, first characteristic. A good soldier of Christ Jesus suffers hardship. Suffers hardship. Verse three, Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. A good soldier is willing to suffer hardship. A good soldier will suffer hardship. Paul was in prison in Rome. And he knew that the end was near for him. He said in chapter four, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've run the race. He knew that it was, it was over. Now, when you read in the book of Acts, you read about Paul being imprisoned in Rome. And he's in his own rented quarters. And he is welcoming people into his own rented quarters. He's under house arrest. He's not under house arrest here. This is not the first Roman imprisonment. This is his second Roman imprisonment. In the book of Acts, Paul was eventually released from Rome and he went on and ministered some more, but then he was rearrested, taken to Rome, and then it was a totally different ball game. He was put in chains and uh, he was put in a dungeon and it was difficult and it was hard and there were afflictions and there were problems. And he tells Timothy, hey, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. He said in chapter one, verse eight, join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. You mark it down, the true Christian life, it comes 
with adversity and suffering. It's just part of the deal. It's part of the ball game. Just like a soldier, if we send a soldier off to Syria or Afghanistan or Iraq, those, those men, those women, they know, man, they're not going for a day at the beach. This is a day in battle. They're not going to Disney World. They're going to war. And it's going to be tough. And it's going to be hard. And there's going to be suffering associated with that warfare. The true Christian life comes with adversity and suffering. The scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You will be pursued in a hostile manner. People will come after you in a hostile manner if you're living godly in Christ Jesus. You say, well, why is that? Well, it's because the true Christian life comes with hatred from the world. That's what Jesus said. If you're going to really live for him, if you're going to do the two things that we talk about all the time in our church, to shine for Christ and to share what the great things the Lord has done for you, if you're going to shine and share, then the world is going to come after you. Jesus said in John chapter 15, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Jesus said, hey, don't, don't be surprised. If the world doesn't stand up and clap and say, oh, we're so excited for you. You're, you've come to know Christ and you're walking with the Lord. That is great. No, the world doesn't like that. They don't want people to come to know Christ. The devil owns the world system. The devil is, he, he has uh, infiltrated the world and he controls the world and he's a deceiver and he deceives, the scripture says, the whole world. And people don't like when you start to shine the light on their sins. And you know, if you're gonna live for Jesus Christ, you're gonna be a good soldier, a worthy soldier, a virtuous soldier, and really shine for Christ and share the gospel and share what the Lord has done in your life, there will be people who will not be your friend anymore. Emily Satterfield, she's married now, so that's not her name, but she stood here with me some years ago and shared how she had lived a, a lesbian lifestyle for seven years from the time she was 15 until she was 22. And then she was saved, marvelously saved, radically saved. And uh, she began to witness constantly. She is such a strong witness and letting people know that uh, you have to repent and believe the gospel and that if you continue on in sin, that all that's left for you is a Christless hell. And man, she said that all her friends in the lifestyle of lesbianism that she was in, man, they dropped her like a hot rock. They didn't wanna have anything to do with her. Why? Because she destroys the narrative that I was born this way. If Emily was born this way, then how come she's not this way anymore? How come she is happily married? And she uh, attacks their whole narrative. And so, man, they, they do not like her. And they come after her. Hey, if you want to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. And so it can cost you friends. It can cost you your job. We have heard about the, the bakers in Oregon. They wouldn't violate their conscience and they wouldn't bake a wedding cake for a homosexual wedding. And man, the, the hounds of hell were released upon them and they ended up losing their business as a result of that and having all these fines put upon them, a little mom and pop bakery shop. It can cost you your job. I have a friend of mine who's in corporate America and he's a very strong Christian, very outspoken on Facebook and social media. And he's told me before, he said, Jeff, I, I just know that it's just a matter of time before my company comes down and tells me to shut it off, to quit uh, presenting Christ to the world like I'm doing. And he said, I, I believe that one day it's going to cost me my job. Hey, it, it costs to serve Jesus. It costs you friends, costs you your job, it might cost you your freedom. John Bunyan, 
who lived in the 1600s. He spent 12 years incarcerated. Why was he incarcerated? Because he committed the crime of preaching the gospel. Spent 12 years in prison. God used that time. It wasn't wasted time. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress while he was in prison, and that book has been used for centuries to help people in the Christian life. May cost you your freedom. Hey, it may cost you your life. Paul's getting ready to get his head cut off. Cost him his life. Peter was crucified upside down. All the disciples save John were killed for their faith. Hey, suffer hardship as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. You say, well, Jeff, what is the way that I could get out of the hardship thing? Because I don't really like suffering. I don't really like hardship. I, I, I kind of like to be in the Lord's army, but I'd like to be a reservist. You know, I'd like other people to go out there and maybe I could, what's a way that I can get away from, from the hardship aspect of this? Let me tell you how to do it. This is really cool. Go AWOL. If you go AWOL, you leave your post, you bail out, you say it's too tough, you do like John Mark did on the first missionary journey. You say, hey, Paul, uh, Barnabas, this is too hard. I'm out of here. You take the next boat back to home. Do that. Don't shine, don't share. Hide your light under a bushel. Zip your lip when people start talking about uh, morality and they talk about uh, that God is dead. Just don't say anything. And you won't experience the suffering that comes from living godly in Christ Jesus. But you know what you will experience? Jesus said this in Mark chapter eight, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Can you imagine what that would be like for the Lord to return and you've been ashamed of him and he comes and now he is ashamed of you? Listen, going AWOL is not an option for a good soldier. A good soldier is willing to suffer hardship. Second characteristic, a good soldier of Christ Jesus stays focused. Verse four, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. He doesn't entangle himself. That word means to entwine to get consumed and distracted with everyday life. Listen, the good soldier is on a mission and he realizes that I am here for a purpose. We send our soldiers today, if we send them to Syria, if we send them to Afghanistan, if we send them to Iraq, they are on a tour of duty. They're not moving to that country to live like this is my new home. They know this isn't their, that they're going away to a place that's not their home. They're there for a purpose. They're there for a mission. And they uh, are going to complete the mission and then come home because that's not their home. They're just there on a mission. You know, the Bible says that we are citizens of heaven and we're on a mission with the Lord. Philippians chapter three, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory through the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. We're citizens of heaven and we're on a mission. And the mission is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 28, we call that the Great Commission. Our mission is the Great Commission, where Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have command you, commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our mission, to make disciples. We've kind of boiled it down to our mission is to shine for Christ and to share. And when we shine for Christ, when we share the gospel and share how the Lord has saved us, then, then we make disciples that way because they have to hear the message. 
We're citizens of heaven on a mission with the Lord. And see, on our mission, we have to stay focused. Just like the soldiers overseas, they have to stay focused on what they're there for. We have to stay focused. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses encompassing us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. That word fixing means to look away from everything else and put your eyes on him. We're staying focused on him, the one who enlisted us in the Lord's army, the one who has given us the mission in the Great Commission to fix your eyes on him. And see, we're to live for the approval of one, the approval of one, and that is Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who approves you in this life. What matters is the approval of the one in whom you serve for whom you serve. Paul says, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Well, who enlisted you as a soldier? Jesus. Jesus is the one who saves us. He's the one who enlists us as a soldier. And we live the Christian life to please him. And listen, when all is said and done, the only thing that matters in the end is when you stand before the Lord. And you hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the only thing that matters. That's the commendation and the approval from the one who matters. And you know, we we tend to use that a lot at funerals. You know, like everybody has that happen. You know, oh, well, you know, old Jim, he was just a great guy. We know that he's uh, receiving from the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. I don't know. I heard Billy Graham say one time on an interview, he said, I'm not so sure the Lord's going to tell me, well done, good and faithful servant. I was like, good night. What's that going to do for me? I was a little nervous when I heard that. Billy's not going to get it. But listen, you know, we see the, the things that Billy did and we say, wow, what a dynamic uh, believer. God used him so greatly and, and God did but you, you don't know Billy's heart. I don't know Billy's heart. We don't know the things that he deals with. He's not taking for granted that he's gonna hear, hear well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you and I don't need to take that for granted either. We need to live every day to please the one who enlisted us. And, and how do we do that? How do we please the one who enlisted us? Now, this is really important. We please the one who enlisted us by being faithful to him, by being faithful to him. First Corinthians chapter four, verse two says this, moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful, not creative, not ingenious, not winsome, faithful, faithful to the Lord, faithful to the Lord's army, faithful to man his post, her post, faithful to not go AWOL, Faithful to stand firm in the Lord. Faithful to stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Hey, our world is getting increasingly dark. And it is a desperate time in America for Christians to stand up for righteousness, to stand up for the Lord, to stand up for truth. And people say, well, don't get political. Listen, abortion is not a political issue. It's it's a moral issue. The, The sexual immorality, that's not a political issue. That's a moral issue. And we need to stand up for the truth that God's word is true and what God says matters. Though every man may be a liar, the Lord is true. We need to stand up for that. Be faithful. Now, one of the things, when you think of the word faithful, we, we naturally think, and rightly, that being faithful means you're, that you're dependable, that you're reliable, and that's exactly what uh, the Lord wants us to be. That's how it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. A steward was one who uh, managed his master's assets. He had to be faithful with how he managed the assets. And so you're reliable, you're trustworthy. 
Paul told Timothy, hey, Timothy, this is what you're supposed to do in verse two. The things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men. Timothy, you're a faithful man. I entrusted these things to you. I taught you the gospel. Now I want you to teach the gospel to faithful men who are able to teach others also. And that's how the gospel spreads when you tell two friends and they tell two friends and so on and so on and so on. Like the old shampoo commercial of a long time ago. Some of you are thinking, I don't remember that shampoo commercial. Well, you need to watch commercials from the 80s. You'll hear it again. That's how the gospel spreads. It's you tell two friends and entrust with faithful men and they entrust to faithful men and then it just explodes exponentially. And we're to be faithful with what God has given us. Oh, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, oh, oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. What had been entrusted to Timothy? The gospel, the truth of God's word, and he was supposed to guard it, and he was supposed to share it. Listen, we live in a world today where people are watering down the word of God, where people are, are cutting corners on the word of God, massaging the word of God. Why? Because we want to make it politically correct, because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Listen, we're, our job is not to change the word of God. Our job is to speak the truth in love and let the chips fall where they may. This is God's word. I didn't write it. I'm just commissioned by the Lord to preach it. And it's not my job or the job of any herald to change the message given to him from the king. We share the message. And if people don't want to hear the message, well, that's, that's their business. And if they want to kill the messenger, well, that happens but we never change the message. You know, the Bible says in the book of Jude, right before the book of the Revelations, it's important where it's situated. And right before the end comes, what happens? Certain persons are going to creep into the church and they are going to turn the grace of God into a license to sin. And that's what we're seeing in the church today. We're seeing many, many people preach grace, 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 but it's grace devoid of truth, and you don't get saved with grace without truth because you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. Truth is really, really important. And if you separate out and you just present grace without truth, you lead people astray. And they don't follow the Lord. They just say, oh, this is so wonderful. I can live however I want and it doesn't matter. Baloney, it matters. It matters to the Lord. Be faithful, he tells Timothy. You know, King Saul in the Old Testament, he lost his kingdom. Why? Because he wasn't faithful to the Lord. He wasn't faithful to the word that God gave him. He wasn't faithful to the commands of God. What does a good soldier do? He stays focused. He lives for the approval of the one, and he stays faithful to the one. And Jesus said, be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. I love this story, true story, about Charles Jones. Charles Jones was an insurance salesman who became a motivational speaker. He was a tremendous salesman, tremendous motivational speaker, and he liked the word tremendous. Everywhere he went, he would talk about, oh, this is tremendous, and you're tremendous, and that's tremendous. And so they called him Charles Tremendous Jones. That was his nickname. Well, Charles Tremendous Jones was known as one of the greatest speakers who ever lived, one of the greatest motivational speakers. And he, he made uh, millions of dollars being a motivational speaker and going around the country. And, and he had uh, awards from all over the place and accolades and, and letters from presidents and all these things. Well, he had him in a basement in his house in Pennsylvania. And that was kind of his trophy room. And all these great things that he had achieved and accolades and all that stuff from the world. And one day there was a big flood in his hometown and his basement filled with water and mud. He said he went to the house and he walked down some steps and he just saw everything just covered in just mud and scum. And it was just all ruined. All his, his great mementos. And he is heartsick, as you can imagine. And he said when he was walking down the steps to look at all the devastation, he said the Lord whispered to him and said, Charles, don't worry about these things. I was going to burn them up anyway. 
And it really caught his attention. Oh, it's so easy to get attached to those things that don't matter. Listen, a good soldier doesn't get attached to the things that aren't part of his world, that aren't part of his citizenship. He's just on a mission. He's on tour. And his job is to stay focused and to stay faithful. And lastly, a good soldier of Christ Jesus serves by the grace of God. How do you do it? It's by the grace of God. You therefore, verse one, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Listen, you mark it down. None of us can serve successfully in the power of the flesh. You're never gonna be a good soldier in the power of the flesh. It's impossible to do it in the power of the flesh because you don't have it in you. You don't have enough willpower. You don't have enough discipline. You don't have enough determination to handle it when the suffering comes. You'll melt like a snow cone in Phoenix. And when, when all of the pressure comes, it's like in and of yourself, you're not able to stand. Be strong in the Lord, the scripture says, and in the strength of his might, because you can't do it. You know who thought they could do it? Peter. Peter, at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, all of you are going to betray me. All of you are going to fall away. You're going to leave me. And Peter said, oh, no, Lord, I'm not. Hey, these other guys might, but I won't. I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus said, really, Peter? Before a cock crows twice. You're going to deny me three times. Deny that you even know me three times. And we know the story. That's what happened when Peter, who was so... Uh, full of the the fact that I can do this thing because I'm so committed. He couldn't do it. In the power of the flesh, he wilted and melted under the pressure and under the intense heat. None of us can do it. But all of us can abide in Christ and be strengthened by his grace. We can all do that How do I connect to God's grace? How am I strengthened in the grace which is in Christ Jesus? I do it by abiding. That's what Jesus said. John chapter 15, a great chapter. Good one to read today and to meditate on today. I am the vine, Jesus said. You are the branches. And the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. It has to abide in the vine. So he said, abide in me. Abide in me and you'll bear fruit. You'll bear much fruit but you have to abide. That's how a branch bears fruit. It just just abides in the vine. It just stays connected to the vine. As long as it stays connected to the vine, the life-flowing sap, the grace, so to speak, flows through the vine, and there is fruit. You know, you never see a branch on a tree or a branch on a a vine. You never see that branch sweating it out. You never see it. You can talk to it. What are you doing? Trying to bear fruit, it's so hard, it's just so hard. Well, that's, that's not how it works. They're just there. Man, the, the life goes through. Now, you, you disconnect it from the vine, and it doesn't bear anything. Branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You know, there in the ancient world, two ways that they would light a room. You could light a wax candle. You could burn the wick. Or you could light a lamp that was powered by olive oil, symbol of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are here, and you know what? The Christian life for you is so hard. This marriage thing is so hard. This command from God to love your wife as Christ loved the church, oh, that's so hard. You know, pastor, you don't know my wife. No. The wife, her job to respect her husband. I wrote a Facebook post this week, talked about a husband's number one need is respect. He needs to be uh, wanted and needed by his wife. He he needs her to want him in their love life. He, He needs her to not badger him or nag at him or preach at him, but to praise him and encourage him and lift him up and respect him. And a lady responded and, and she said, that's right. But it's so hard to do that. How do you do that when your husband never gives you any encouragement, when he belittles you, when he makes you do all the work and blah, 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 just on and on and on. I mean, he's just a horrible guy she's married to. 
You know, I thought, why'd you marry that guy? He sounds terrible. And I thought, maybe he wasn't like that, but maybe you've been badgering him and he became like that. You never know. It's like Charles Lowry said, the guy came to him and he said, well, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a loser because my dad was an alcoholic. That's why I'm a loser. He said, well, that's one way to look at it, but maybe your dad's an alcoholic because you're a loser. You know, it's like, <laughs> which one came first? And so she's, she, this lady, she was just pouring out her heart and her husband's terrible. How do I do that? And I said, you can't do it. It's impossible in the power of the flesh. It has to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. It can only be done by the grace of Christ Jesus our Lord. Some of you are here and you know what? You know why the Christian life is so hard for you? Because you're burning the wick. And the candle consumes itself when you burn the wick. And you run out of wax and you're done. And you're like, I don't have anything else to give. I'm done here. You're not supposed to burn the wick. You're supposed to burn the oil. And the oil lamp, when you light that wick and it burns the oil, it can go for hour upon hour upon day upon day as it burns the oil. That's the Christian life. It's a principle of abiding. It's a principle of walking with the Holy Spirit of God, of yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit of God. That's how you stay faithful to the Lord. It's by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Listen, I don't know where you are today, but God does, and you do. Maybe you're here and you know, you say, Jeff, I'm one who's, kind of left my post. I know I'm a believer. I know I've put my faith and trust in Jesus. I know it's not just in my head. It's real in my heart, but, but I've felt the pressure, the pressure to compromise with sin, the pressure to go along, to get along at, at work and at school. And, and so I've just kind of left my post. I've just kind of zipped my lip. I'm not really shining. I'm not sharing. I'm just trying to stay under the radar gone AWOL. It's not too late for you. Get back in the game to get back at your post, to be strong in the grace, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Maybe you're here and you know what? You're not, you're not in the Lord's army. You've never trusted Christ. Listen, the Lord army, the Lord's army wins. We win. And we spend forever in heaven with him. And all those outside of the Lord's army, they die and go to hell. You don't want to die and go to hell. You can give your heart and life to Jesus. He'll save anybody who comes to him in repentance and faith. You turn away from your sin and you turn to the Savior and he will save you and he will wrap his arms of love around you and he'll put you in his army and enlist you as a soldier to do battle. To remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight in prayer. To fight by standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what comes your way, by his grace and by his grace alone. Listen, in order to win the spiritual battle, you must have power within. And that power only comes from the Lord. So here's the big question. Does the Lord live in your life? Has there ever been a time when you've truly surrendered your heart to Him? Now, if not, that can happen today with this simple prayer. Just say from your heart, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross and rose again on the third day. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, to come into my heart, to be my Lord and Savior, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please call that toll-free number. Take the time to let me know what's going on. Hey, you really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. 
From his heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about the plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real